Good afternoon and welcome. I am Jeff Fleming. I'm director of the Des Moines Art Center. It's my great pleasure to welcome you today. And as uh, I am equally thrilled to welcome the artist Joyce Scott. I first met Scott. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> I first met Scott about 30 years ago when I organized a solo exhibition of her work for the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art. She and I, of course, were very, very young at the time. Her art struck me then, as it does now, as powerful and transformative for many reasons. These reasons include, first, her use of craft, um, which derives from Native American as well as African bead traditions, as well as textiles traditions, such as knitting and quilting. Now seems to be the appropriate time to acknowledge, as we often do, that we are gathering today on traditional, ancestral, and unceded land of the Iowa tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, the Iowa tribe of Oklahoma, and the Meskwaki Nation of the Sac and Fox tribe of the Mississippi. The second reason is their use of humor as a tool to engage an audience. And last, and perhaps most importantly, it's her subject matter, which is deadly serious and potent, related to race, gender inequality, economic disparities, and discrimination. Getting to know Scott personally, as you will soon, is an experience in and of itself. She is a force of nature, she ignites her room with her presence, and she is a powerful black woman. She has accomplished a great deal in her career. She is a 2016 MacArthur Genius Fellow as a well yeah. as well as the recipient of numerous awards and honors. And here's a list. National Endowment for the Arts, Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation, Anonymous Was a Woman, American Craft Council, National Living Treasure Award, Lifetime Achievement Award from the Women's Caucus for the Arts, and the Baker Award among many. In fact, this April, she will be honored by the Smithsonian by receiving the Visionary Artist Award. Example, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Examples of her artwork are included in many museum and public collections, including, here's the list too, Baltimore Museum of Art, Brooklyn Museum of Art, National Museum of African American History and Culture, Detroit Institute of the Arts, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Metropolitan Museum of Art, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the Smithsonian, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and of course, the Des Moines Art Center. So please welcome now, Joyce Scott. Living is the 
have no chains on me and oh, all I ask of living is to have no chains on me and all I ask of dying is to go oh, naturally I, I only want to go naturally and when I die and when I die One child born left to carry on, on, carry on. Hello, I'm Joyce J. Scott. I would say I'm the chosen one, but after what our president said, it doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? <laughs> Before I go on talking about me, I'd like to thank the Des Moines Art Center for bringing me here, and Jill, who just, oh, thank you. I'm so used to being the loudest one in the room, I seldom need. Jill, who just sneaked behind me with the pants that are open on the side so she can show everybody everything. That's Jill. <laughs> And the big tall Jeff, he dinner for me last night. His house is wonderful. Why, Terry and those other people over there were there last night. They're tall. They're very tall people. That's what I remember. I'm very happy to be back in Des Moines again. I know I've been in Iowa, but I don't remember when or where. That just shows how old I actually am. But I've been very blessed in my lifetime, too at the age of 23 decided that I was going to be a full-time artist and I never looked back. I just kept being self-employed and making artwork. So I'm gonna take you on that little family journey. This is me with my parents, Elizabeth Caldwell, Talford Scott, and Charlie Scott Jr. when we were young and innocent. These are my father's parents, Charlie Scott Sr. and Mamie Scott. I'm showing you this because I'm talking about how I a young African-American girl from the East Coast, through real perseverance, hard work, and the support of everyone, became this person you see today. I come from a family on both sides of sharecroppers. My father's side of the family from Durham, North Carolina, they, they picked a lot of cotton and vegetables. I'm sorry, they were tobacco crop people. And Mamie Scott was a quilt worker. I think they had eight children. When you look at her work, you see the translation of the traditional form, right? I can hear mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. humming or singing the blues or singing some kind of spiritual. And when people look at this kind of work, many times they think, well, yep, that's African-American artists. If one form of artwork could represent the, the entire miasma, the entire matrix of of an ethnicity or of a group. But I know what they mean. I look at the piece on the right and I'm thinking about the, the Kenti cloth that comes from Ghana, you know, strips of fabric put together, all very eccentric, esoteric, I'm doing all these words. <laughs> it's actually done in the old days by a man with a very, very simple loom that's a rock connected to string and he, yeah, yeah. He'd be imbuing this fabric with his own personal spirit and story. Then he'd sew the quilts together, and he'd have his own idea what symmetric, what symmetry was. I see that with my grandmom, who's taken apart a simple kind of technique and made it her own. This is my mother's father, Samuel Caldwell. He had 14 kids, 12 live, and he had as many jobs as he, as he had children. They were sharecroppers too. They picked a lot of 
cotton in South Carolina. So he worked for the railroad, he used to raise horses, he was a musician, they picked cotton. Of course, both sides of my family had stills and he was also a quilt maker. Now they lived in a very prosaic cabin, not unlike what slaves would live in. I don't know if the kitchen was in the house, but I know they had an outhouse for a bathroom. Think about 14 people living in a small cabin. Of course, they didn't have a, a set up quilting frame, so they used to heist it or hoist it to the top and lower it down and people would quilt on it. My grandfather inc included. Many times kids would crawl, this is what my mother would say, under that while they were making their own samples and listen to the family stories. And if a needle dropped, then they'd send it back. Now I see this kind of asymmetry when I see the quilt of my grandfather when he wanted to dye fabric. He couldn't go to the art store. He had to wade in the water, get some yellow ochre clay and, and dye that with the fabric. And once again, those strips are lined up together. And I'm showing you a, a torn up quilt because these quilts didn't exist on their own. When one started to pass away or die, you just added another page to the book. This is his wife. Mary Jane uh, called, well, she's the one who had the 12 children, so she wasn't out picking much cotton. You know, they said that many times the quilts they made were made from the very fabric that was spun from the cotton that they picked. They'd go directly to the mills, buy fabric or trade up to get this fabric. So it was a multi-layer experience for them. They'd take the short, short cuts of the cotton, because cotton has to be a certain length, so it's the best. And they would spin that and weave it in with something else they had. And they would crochet booties and little sandals because it was so warm, they didn't have to wear their good shoes. In fact, they had one good pair of good shoes. One of the stories was my grandfather would be coming in from the railroad, walking down the road with 14 pair of shoes strapped to him and candy in its pockets and the kids would come after him and knock him down and grab the candy and you didn't want to be the last person to get the pair of shoes because you got them whether they fit or not. I want you to see this quilt. My mother said she brought this quilt with her from South Carolina and I'm the one who tore it up. She said that, you know, your parents blame you for everything. <laughs> well, back then, quilts were easier and cheaper to make and to get than a blanket, which costs more money. My parents are depression age kids. And I don't mean the kind of depression that we have now. It's like, I don't know whether I should take Spirit Airline or Delta. I mean, like, you know, real depression, folks. I don't know. With blue, do you think this is the color? You think? Not that depression. I want you to see this quilt because I believe these quilts are diaries for pre-literate people. You don't read or write well. Maybe you have a family write, a diary, and everything's written in that. But everybody doesn't necessarily have a book. My mom and dad both went to one-room schoolhouses. And they'd all be playing out in the yard together, white kids, black kids. They were all to, together. But when they went into this one-room schoolhouse, there was a sheet in the middle that separated the kids. The White kids got the books first, and if they were kids who liked you, then they wrote little bon mots, they wrote little love letters when it finally got to the kids on the black side. If not, they wrote nasty things. But think about it. You're just playing in the front yard with these kids, and now you're separated. Well, this quilt represents that to me because there's always someone like me who's gotten me off and just coming in from France or something, and they come to a family thing in the South, and I don't care who you are, what ethnic group you are, everybody has an auntie like this, whether her name is Beulah, Hattie, Gwyn Gansha, Juanita, Blunt, whoever this is, girl, come on over here and give me a hug. How you doing? Well, I'm fine, I'm just a great. Come on and sit right here. But it's tattered and torn. Does anybody know who I just did? Tattered. Betty Davis. <laughs> now, I know that there are geezers my age in here who know who she is. <laughs> it's tattered and, tattered and torn, honey. That's not tattered and torn. Don't you know what that is? 
but it stained those of Uncle Benny's knee prints. Every summer, Uncle Benny tried to grow the sweetest tomatoes, and he never could. We had so much cha-cha pickle. And he'd be out there, and we saved his britches, and that's his shirt, and that's his daughter's dress. She's a slut, you know. And <laughs> so these quilts become vehicles for storytelling. Each stitch is a word, and they become sentences and paragraphs that talk about this family history for people who, in the beginning, didn't read or write very well for people who couldn't go off and just buy fabric. So they recycled or upstyled, upgraded the fabrics and turned them into books that people slept under. My mom always talked about this kind of magic carpet ride that you have once you rolled up in one of these quilts. You see, you see that energy spurt? I just got all of the kind of nutrients from the lunch I just had. They just all rolled into one and gave me that energy spurt. I'm sorry for you, that's what the rest of this lecture is going to be like. <laughs> so my mom said to me about this quilt that she swore I tore up. If you love it, you ought to put a new page on it. That's what she actually called the quilt top. And you ought to write on it, which is the stitching. This is my mother, Elizabeth Caldwell Taufer Scott. The bane of my existence and the most important person to me. Not that my dad wasn't. My parents separated when I was around 12. I said, Mom, when did I start getting fat? She said, around 12. Got it. Well, my father moved much later to North Carolina to take care of his, his mom. But my parents were together all the time, even though they were not living together. My father, and my last name is Scott, my mother's maiden name is Scott, because we must be part Scottish. You know that stereotype about Scottish people being frugal? Stingy is the word we're looking for. <laughs> my father could take a quarter and squeeze it, make a dollar 25 cents, and put it in his pocket. My mother was the artist who was always trying to extract that dollar and a half to make art with. You know, I, I didn't realize what the difference between them was until I visited my father in North Carolina many years hence. And uh, I wanted to see, you know, where the family lived. And my father was very shrewd, who knew what my hair looked like, who knew what I was wearing. He was embarrassed by that sometimes. So I always take me to people's homes when they're at work so I didn't get to see anything. He took me to this ramshackled house and told me that was this little place that they lived in. And I saw, don't go over there, and of course I went that part of the wall was covered with newspaper. And it, it reminded me of a story my mama told me about the argument they had when she covered the bathroom with comics. And she did it to teach me how to read, color, syncopation, the whole thing. And all he saw was poor people insulating their homes. So that tells you about the difference between them. But he taught me how to keep that $100.25, and she taught me how to spend it. <laughs> my mom was uh, quite a powerful woman. We have an exhibition together at the Baltimore Museum of Art right now. Uh, she was not bridled by the rules of textiles. She said that quilts didn't have to be squares or rectangles, because once you got under them, they changed their shape anyway. And there are a couple other stories I could tell, but there are children here. <laughs> Thank you very much. My mom didn't also care about people's ideas about what you should put on a quilt. She believed in, in building and tell a story. A lot of them were allegorical. They talked about her being a kid, how they would catch frogs, the different snakes, and butterflies, the color of the sky, the color of plants. The large quilt you see on the left is at the Delaware Museum. It's owned by them. I don't know if it's up. It's called Grand Grandfather's Cabin. And that kind of building you see is a cabin. And under it, there's snakes, stars in the sky. My mother died at 95. She was born in 1916, which was like de facto 18-something. They didn't have electricity. She was old enough to remember the first uh, T-bottle Ford. Very, very different. She lived long enough to see computers. And she was, by the time Obama became president, bedridden because she died of dementia. And 
she was no longer talking or moving, and I said, Mom, we have a black president in her eyes to this. I hope to live that long to, to be amazed by the world in which I'm living in. Well, the story about this grandmom, so grandfather's quilt, those snakes on the bottom, as she said, every year they had a cantankerous snake who lived under the house. He was big and he scared everybody. And when molten season came, he'd come and knock on the door. <laughs> Grandpa would kick it open, boom, and shoot a, a rifle outside, and the only thing that was left was his skin. Now, that's a family story. So she decided to make a quilt about it. Now, that complication, that confluence of people that I've just shown you pictures of created moi. Little Joyce is what they used to call me. I lived a block away from my elementary school, across the street from the projects. You know, the rat-infested city that uh, the big rat talks about. <laughs> Actually, in, in Baltimore, the Baltimore Sun wrote uh, about his statement, uh, rather to uh, have rats than to be one, man. <laughs> I was making a joke at lunch table. Oh. I wasn't doing I was trying to make a joke. Thank you. That was a lead into my joke. Uh, really at the lunch table about Baltimore does have specific rats. I mean, Baltimore is, you know, I'm a Baltimore around. You see, we have a kind of eccentricity about it. So like when I'm putting the trash out, I was waylaid by rats. They had guns and masks. I'm like, you, you're a rat. Why do you need a mask? They're like, give me the trash and your cell phone. Come on. Baltimore. It was funnier at lunch. Well, <laughs> I was really one of those kids who was raised by my community, by a village. I did live across the street from the projects. And there was a lady who I can't remember who continued my mother's idea about the, you know, the comic books. I would stay with her sometimes after school. And my job with her was to cover a cigar box with the comics. But I'd have to read the paper, I'd have to read the comics, I'd have to know all the colors, and then we'd have to craft something three-dimensionally. Wow. I was a latchkey kid, which means I walked my block home from school. Miss Agnes and her husband lived on the first floor, and I'd go to the second floor, and the entire apartment was mine. Did my Homework called my mom, because my mother, the sainted Elizabeth Caldwell Scott, was a saint. I have two friends who I still am friends with now, 60 years later. And she would let them come home and she'd have lunch, food laid out for us. I learned many years later that she really ate at work. She was a nanny and a housekeeper. She really ate at work because she knew it's a possibility those kids weren't going to eat. So she gave them her food so that they'd be OK. And we are close till this day. Well, people ask me, Joyce, when did you become an artist? And I say, in vitro. <laughs> I was born an artist. I was like you know, doing small drawings and, and uh, designs for the future on my mom's tummy. When I came out, I said to the doctor, move, you're in my light. <laughs> I went back in twice because I didn't like the first two takes. But boom, boom. Thank God you're working with me. Oy. <laughs> my mother was my first art teacher. I probably did beadwork around five. She, she taught me how to sew and how to weave, how to paint. She just taught me things. You know, she didn't read very well. My father didn't read and write very well. I was the house accountant, so I filled out all the bills. And I did that until my father moved to North Carolina. And I was in my 40s. In doing that, I crafted a really great relationship with them. And I became uh, this person who was a purveyor of the crafts and the artwork that came through intergenerationally to me. The passport that I use when I travel is this skill that was given to me by my mom, the needle and thread. I've traveled in many places, and there's always somebody who sews or spins or weaves, and that's always a conversation. When you add music to it, you can have a, a fast kind of friendship with someone. 
I went to the Maryland Institute College of Art when it was still just three buildings. I told people I was the first slave to graduate from the Maryland Institute of Art. <laughs> See how you're laughing, but there are other people like the other people are like, that's not funny. Is, it? <laughs> Is that funny? I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh about slavery and stuff. It's now like a megalopolis of buildings and artiness and computer this and computer that. Well, I went to the Institute believing I was going to be a painter. And as a freshman, I was disabused of that idea for the betterment of myself and the entire human race. That was actually said to me. I thought, I'm not that bad at painting. I always thought I was going to be a teacher. I just didn't think it would be so fast. So I got my undergraduate to school, uh, degree in education. Well, as I was student teaching, I realized I'd be a 700 pound alcoholic if I taught within the school system. <laughs> it's 1969, this was true. And I was thin and good looking then. So I went with two friends, like any other self-respecting hippie flower child to Mexico. And we ran off to Mexico just because we knew America wasn't working for us. And while I was there, I was blessed because, you know, I talk to God all the time and God is like, you will be in trouble. I'm going to have to take some extra time for you. <laughs> and now that my mom is in heaven, she's up there talking to him too. I got to the San Miguel de Allende, which was a bilingual arts colony kind of city. It was the first year that the Instituto Allende was doing graduate degrees in visual art. And that's where I got my graduate degree. This was amazing because there I was weaving. I had the weaving an enormous loom that someone else warped for me. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Thank you, Black Jesus, for that one. I also was studying metals again, making jewelry tie, dyeing, you name it, my degree was in crafts. I was doing ceramics, it was all wonderful. What did I learn? Of course, these are things that my family is doing already, but I was in a country where the majority of people were brown. That made a real difference for me. Because I was born in 1948, which meant my 50s, those really young years, my really formulative years, were raised in a country that was overtly segregated. And then the 60s were hippie times, and civil rights times where we're passing them. And then I'm in graduate school in 1970, where I could have some kind of culmination of all those ideas. I was also in a country that had their ancient, ancient monuments still intact. I could go to a pyramid. I could go to a temple. I could see the history. We don't have that kind of history in this culture. I mean the icons of it. This was really important to me. And it started my sojourn around the world. One of the places I went to was Panama to work with the Cunas on the San Blas Island off the coast. It's a complex of around 300 islands. Some are smaller than this room, some of this room and larger. I went in the 70s when there were not a lot of tourists. So we were on a, a puddle jumper, you know, little plane with people getting on and off in their indigenous dress with chickens and other stuff. Okay. I mean, I'm from, parents are from the South, but come on, chickens and goats on a plane? <laughs> then we got on a canoe. I am very traditionally the stereotypical African American who doesn't swim well. We're on a trip. Um, it's uh, oyoy. Oyoy was not Ivonics, it's something else. <laughs> Those people in the tribe know what I'm talking about. She's looking at me like she's not doing that. <laughs> yes, darling, I slipped, forgive me. So, we go to little islands and I take my molas and they laugh at me and I laugh with them and I learn things about doing this technique which we call reverse applique or molo work. Now, you know, applique means to apply a piece of fabric on another fabric. But reverse applique is applying layers of fabric, cutting through the top, stitching it down, and then sequentially cutting through all the other layers until you get to the bottom. Now, 
The Kunas are supposedly the second shortest people in the world, so I was a giant then. <laughs> but we all have the same nose, same skin tone. They laughed with me, they talked. We have one translator because they didn't speak Spanish, basically. And I sat down and stitched with them. I had my hair in braids, they looked. Back then I used to put charms on the end of all of my braids so I could take them off and give them to people. And they'd give me things. We knew we'd be on a place that didn't have light. So we took a glow stick with us and showed it to a little boy and broke it. And he was amazed. And then that entire night we went from hut to hut trying to find that little boy to tell him, don't bite it. It didn't occur to her, it, us, you know, this is modern, coming into a place that's still living in an ancient way, that he might not know the difference, just start chewing on it and it poison and I'd be in jail in Danaba. So, okay, so we're going to, these aren't houses, these are for lack of a better term, hut. And we're looking, and as I'm looking in and we're trying to explain, somebody's doing mola work or somebody's doing bead work. What did I learn from them? They're candle work and they're doing mola work, the tiniest of stitches. Or there's a technique where they do very, very, very long strands of beads and then wrap them around you. They didn't use needles for that. They dipped the thread in wax, twisted it until it became a needle and then st I'm just in these people's houses just looking, laughing, talking. I had multiple piercings in my ears. They're looking at them, we're doing, they pierced their nose, they pretended to pierce me. I backed out of the joint. <laughs> we finally found the little boy. I think that was the first place that I, no, maybe Guatemala was the first place after Mexico. I would come home, I'd work to make enough money, I tell my mom I gotta go, and I keep going places. When I was in Guatemala, I won't tell you that story. When I was in Peru, we were going up the hill to a, um, I suppose to hold that. Can't you hear me? Okay. Uh, that's right, you're recording. Wait a second, did I sign a release for a recording? <laughs> Wait a second. Because you know they're going to use me. Somebody's going to put me on, on YouTube with like weird eyes and a no, woo, woo, that kind of thing. Okay. So by that time, I knew I should take amplement with me, things that I could use to start a conversation because the, many of the people were once again indigenous tribal people who did not necessarily speak Spanish. So I took my spindle with me, which is a European spindle. It's kind of big, and I've never been that great at spinning. So I'm walking kind of next to these people. And honestly, we do have the same nose and skin color, and they're looking at me like, not who is she, what is she? And I'm doing my spindle, dropping it, doing my spindle, and they're spinning, which is their traditional spin, which is like a big bead, a toggle bead at the end of a stick. Mine is like a dish shape. Well, mine is, is, is more efficient in a certain way because the, the, the spinning of the yarn sits on that little table and you can put a lot on and theirs is different. So they're watching me drop and I'm walking with them and we're walking and we get closer to just a little right. And so they take my spindle from me and I take theirs and I keep dropping their spindle and they have mine down flat. And by the time we get to the top of the hill, I'm in their kiosk talking about wool, right? Drawing little pictures, showing them things. They're taking the things out of my hair. And I learned about them in a different kind of way. So that kind of sojourn has been with me my entire kind of trek around the world. For years, I was a weaver. We talked about this at lunch. I tried everything with weaving. Weaving on the loom, off the loom, multiple things, this and that. And I realized that it wasn't what I needed. Remember, I'm a 
hear pizza, I would need translucency and like coming through and trans, come by, my Lord. Translucency within myself and my deeds. Well, when you're weaving fibers, the light either is absorbed into or bounces off. It's really hard to do translucency. I loved doing this. It was definitely a family way of working, but what I really needed was to work with glass. In 1976, I went back to Haystack, the Haystack Mountain School of Crafts. It was the bicentennial year of this country, and I learned the peyote stitch from a native woman. I also was studying traditional Navajo weaving, which put the kibosh on my weaving ever again. <laughs> although I think I'm going to set my loom up again, but it's one of those things where you have seven scrillion threads to an inch, and she wanted me to do a geometric design, and I just wanted to do snakes and black people. <laughs> she left me alone, she's not unique, but I know she's walking over there saying, how did this happen to me? <laughs> the peyote stitch was different than what I'd ever done before. I either did beadwork on a loom, which meant I always had different warp and weft threads I had to worry about, or I sewed it on fabric. That's what my mom taught me to do. But the peyote stitch is a technique where you only need the needle, the bead, and the thread, and you can be as sculptural or as flat as you want it. The piece on uh, the left, the piece that's all the stripes, I sent that to the White House uh, for Michelle Obama. And I hadn't heard from anybody in a year. I hope she has it. This might be one of those things that you have to leave at the White House. I don't I hadn't heard from her in a year. So I called up this friend who had kind of expedited this and said, I think there's somebody in the kitchen cooking in that necklace. It's been a year, I want to know what's up. Because this is like, you know, yet one more uh, African-American uh, stereotype. We're late, not that late, I hope. <laughs> Honestly, not long after that, I received a note from her. Of course, it's a standard note. And it said, though, something like, I hope we can, this is not, I'm, I'm badly paraphrasing it, but stay in touch. And I'm thinking that Michelle Obama does not want to talk to me. She wants a match and pair of earrings for. <laughs> I'm no fool, Michelle Obama. And you know, I really sent her the necklace because every time I saw on TV, she had a big neck full of plastic. I'm not against plastic, but you know, you see her and it's big plastic balls and big plastic chains. And I'm like, well, you, why don't you have some beadwork on? Oh, dude. And then I said, I never saw it. The lavender piece that you have that I usually wear is an important piece for me. And this is really important when I have young students in the room. I don't know if you could tell, but I have a kind of glowing ego. It's kind of large and permeating. <laughs> I find that I am best in my studio when I can park that at the door and come into the studio and just submit submit to my time there, to the technique, to the materials that I use, and not try to impel my vision on the work, just flow with it. And this piece is so important because when I made this, I'd never made a piece like this before, even though I'd made components like it. And it showed me that even in my 60s, I could always something, learn and experience something new in my studio if I would allow it. And that kind of idea about my work also always addresses how I live my everyday life, about attempting to learn something new about myself and others, if I allow it. And we know how introspection is. So we would rather run in front of a moving car <laughs> than look at ourselves and, and try to learn. So that necklace, which I tried to sell a couple of times, is now in my collection because of that importance for me. I told you my mom was a nanny. She said to her, uh, to me that one of the most hurtful things that ever happened to her was when a, we have kids here so I'm gonna use the N word. I don't like saying that because I think the real word tells you just how 
potential and how hurtful it is. But when an infant called her the N-word, now you have to step back and think, wait a second, that baby's not at the club. That two-year-old is not listening to M M and N or somebody M and M or you know something like the Beastie Boys or whoever. That's being said by someone that my mother works for every day. You have to know that nannies, mammies, housekeepers, they know everything about you. Not only do they wash your drawers, but they open your drawers and put things in and see all that stuff you hide around. They know that much about you. And so to know that you're indoctrinating their children with that was very hurtful to her. And so I made uh, the piece on the right. This is about a little boy who's gonna have to make a decision about who that woman, who is not silver, she's platinum, who that woman is to him. Eventually, what a thing to do to a kid for him to have to make that choice. And the other is about a woman who's holding an ambrotype. An ambrotype is an old style of photography when it, you took the image and put it directly on glass. It's of a white man at the turn of the last century. They're a married couple and the little boy, the issue, a girl, the issue of their union is peeking at you from behind her apron. My best voice is as an artist. My best voice to talk about the things that hurt and push me into speech is as an artist. I'm not a preacher, I'm not a politician. This is my soapbox. Sometimes think that artists live in art cities in an art house with art pets. You know, our children, all you do is think about art, but I have to pay my gas and electric bill too. I read papers. I realize that I am affected by everything that affects everyone else. I do a lot of work on misogyny, racism, ageism. You know, I do on the big isms. I was really shaken up about what happened to the people of Darfur which is in the Sudan, and that president is now on trial for uh, you know, crimes against nature. The Janjuri was a, a tribe that would come in on camels. This is how medieval we still are. And attack these, these little towns, these little villages on camels Sometimes they would behead the mom and leave it with the babe. Well, people ran off to, you know, these little villages or they ran off to places where they thought they'd be safe. But the women would still have to go out and gather water and, and wood. And they'd be waylaid, raped, cut apart. And so I did a, a series about this. And these series of pieces are small enough for you to hold in your hand and really peruse. So this whole series is called Day After Rape. I really culled this down because I do a lot of work. So there are around six pieces in that. Last year, I did a very large, my second largest retrospective at Grounds for Sculpture, which is in Stanford, New Jersey. Um, I'm going to show you some of the work from that. You know, I do have an ego, but there's hubris involved, but for a good reason. When I'm also talking to a lot of students, I tell them, I, I have no reason to be mediocre or in a crowd. My charge is to be the best. Now, I don't think I'm going to be the only best one in the world, but I'm going to be one of them. So I intend to be the best bead worker you've ever met. I don't want to just keep that. I share that ability, but I want to be the best. So this piece that you see, think of it as half the size, you see, all made out of small beads. And it's about a day in Harriet Tubman's life when she's walking in the daylight into the night. This is the piece that's owned uh, 
by the African American Museum in Washington, DC. My gallery asked me in 2011 after my mom passed, well, what do you think you want to do? And I said, oh, I think I should go to Murano, Italy and work with the glass people there. <laughs> That's what I think should happen. And they said, OK. <laughs> you know I was not expecting OK. And I think that's the same year that I had my knee done, or maybe after Murano. It was ap after Murano, maybe. I don't remember. So I went there and I worked with these Muranis. These are Italian guys in a classic shop. The shop we were in was hundreds of years old. And then I walked in, Hello! <laughs> and I was draped in velvet and a big hat, and they were just like, <laughs> But they were like, And we worked together. And when I thought there was a lull in the room, I'd start singing, but not like, you know, Stevie Wonder. But give them some more pride. And they go, hey, I'm gonna ask you to go, yeah, 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 just, yeah. And we worked together to make these figures. I did a lot of Buddhas. I do Buddhas. A lot, actually. And people are always still asking me, why are you doing Buddhas? So, well, firstly, I'm a human being. I'm an artist. Anything is available to me. I can do anything I wish, and I shall. But anything is available to me. But also, I use a Buddha because he wasn't a god. He was a human who worked on evolving. Come on, is that a great idea? He worked on becoming the best and highest form of himself. I got to work on Buddha. So this is a series that I did there. There were four Buddhas that represented the four seasons, and I don't mean the hotel. <laughs> the four seasons of the year, four time zones, for this, for that. So this is summer, and I wanted to push myself to make a person on fire. So I had them make a lamp worked figure for me and I made beadwork of this person flaming on the hand of this Buddha. And the face is my beadwork that's been fused into the glass. So I was teaching them new things. I went there for two years. By the second year, we were doing very well together. I also did a residency at a place in New Jersey that we can't remember the name, and we cast glass there. This is a series of war women. The dice are there about how it's just a toss of the dice about whether you live or die, who you are in life. And those cast pieces are guns, penises, and heads. And she's carrying on her back a backpack, which is really a blown glass heart. I used to teach at Penland in North Carolina a lot. My mom would come with me. In fact, my first class we did together. Uh, a friend would drive us there, and she'd get to take a class at Penland and take care of my mom while I was there. We'd stop to see my father in Durham. He'd talk a lot of trash. I was still happy to see him. Father talked like that, and always had some joke. You're like, Dad, that's really nice. No. Yeah, 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 okay. Right. He was a rascal, my dad. And while we were driving through the mountains into Penland, there's a little place that we stopped, and it was a gun that was really a liquor bottle. And that's when I realized what a shot of liquor was. Because he told me that like, the, the good old boys would put liquor in the gun and then drink it out of it. I don't know how many accidents happen where you blew your head off. <laughs> so this piece is about the young boys who are fighting, who are using guns indiscriminately, and who are losing their lives. The top of his head is blown off. And this is a larger piece, probably around uh, 18 inches tall. Back to grounds for sculpture. That's my mother's quilt that was in Harry Tubman's Closet, which is another word for boudoir. 
So I set up a room thinking, now Harriet Tubman, you know, was a freedom fighter. She was called the Moses. But she had to have some downtime, especially when the Civil War was over and she finally went to New York with her second husband because she tried to get her husband, her first one, to go with her. And he said no, and she said bye. Right. Right. So her second husband, and she lived in North, in New York. Now, you have to remember, this is a woman who freed hundreds of people. She was not five feet tall. And she was injured in her youth. Somebody was throwing something at someone else and hit her in the head. So she had migraines and blackouts. This, this woman was really a superheroine. And so at the end of her life, she didn't just go buy a house and sit around. This house she opened for people who had no place to go and for slaves who now were in the North and had no one, especially older ex-slaves. Wow. So the name of this show was Harriet Tubman and Other Truths. So it was a survey of my artwork and a couple of pieces specifically dedicated to Harriet Tubman. This is Shackles. It's a blown heart and a hand connected. <coughs> I'm thinking that is your heart and the purpose shackled together. Uh, this is a mosaic that is in the National Airport, and it's not. It's the Reagan, Ronald Air. I tell people to go there and walk on it because it will be the only time you'll be allowed to walk on me. <laughs> this is the piece we were talking about at lunch. This is a 15-foot Harriet Tubman. They stupidly asked me when we were putting this show together, well, what would you like to do? I would like to make a 15-foot Harriet Tubman made out of dirt, soil, and I want her to be holding a gun that's 12 or 15 feet long. And then I, as, the, as we worked with it, my idea grew. There's beadwork all over her that's beaded and then placed into her body, and I want her to have graffiti all over her. And they said, okay. <laughs> So we made this because the show was up for, I think, four months or maybe six. So we had to have a, a Harriet Tubman that would last through the snow, rain, and warmer weather. So we, we had our dirtologist, Dirty Dan, sit together and make up a, a recipe for dirt that could last. Well, he made such a great, great recipe that I said at lunch that I'm sure under the darkness of night, they they knocked it down <laughs> because she would not die like Harriet Tubman. And can you imagine them knocking it down in daylight with people looking at, what are you doing? Ah, uh, just knocking Harriet Tubman down. What? The words on her are from a letter that Frederick Douglass wrote to her in answer to a plea from her to write something about a book that was written about her. And the letter is so amazing, you should look it up. In it he says to her, of course I will. I write about it. You actually do it. I'll do anything for you. My God, it was so amazing. So this is 15 feet tall. That's another view of it. We were talking about sculpture in the sculpture garden and that you can put a, a plants around it to keep people out. It didn't, which was good for me. Also, the plants that are around it are the plants that she would have seen going back and forth from the north and into the Carolinas to free people. You see how brightly colored it is. Then I made a second Harriet Tubman in an installation that's 10 feet tall. She's holding a large gun. And all of these guns have beads and uh, uh, blown glass and cast glass pieces. She's wearing, holding a veve, which in Haiti would be a prayer or um, an investiture of truth. And it's, excuse me, it's beaded. She's standing on a cliff with, pleat, uh, with quilts that were made for my uh, father's mother because quilts were very, very important in the Underground Railroad. 
you would see them uh, on a lawn or on the fence of a church or on a clothesline, and they were a signpost that told you it was safe to come in, you must keep going on because of the symbology. And up in the tree, there's a figure that's around 12 feet long. It's of a woman. I used her in an installation in New Orleans. But here she symbolizes a hanked. Now, a hanked is a southern word for a ghost. You've heard of bottle trees, right? Well, bottle trees were supposedly created to catch some hanks. They're attracted by the glitter of the bottle, and they go up in the bottle, but they can't get out. Slaves and sharecropping people would be coming home in the evening, because remember, they didn't have like an eight-hour day. They'd be coming home from the work, and they were afraid of ghosts. They, lightning bugs could be considered a ghost. So they set these sort of traps for them to go into. Also, they tried to go on the other side of the water because supposedly Hanks could cross water. So this family story made me really think about how I ought to, to make a Hank. These Hanks weren't always horrible figures. They were things that would guide you through the night, too. And I had a lot of fun doing these things because I got to get on a cherry picker and go up and move things around and shake the cherry picker. They told me to stop shaking the cherry picker. I got to shake the cherry picker. And then, like, people told me later, did you have on a, you know, a strap to connect? No. When Obama was in, I'm also a printmaker. When Obama was in office, the thing they kept yelling about was his big old ears. So I'd made a series of prints about him. Here, Obama is Buddha with the big old ears. I think that might be the only one that you see. If you haven't figured it out yet, I was a performer for many years. Now I basically sing and maybe sometimes do monologues. But in my youth, I was a member of a two-person partnership called the Thunder Thigh Review. That's what's on your left. We traveled around the United States, Scotland, Holland, Canada doing work. Think about Whoopi Goldberg, Kathy and Mo. That was that period. We were, we were writing performance artwork, talking about all the isms I said earlier, using comedy and music. Unfortunately now, you see those beautiful um, lace stockings? I, now my cellulite looks exactly like that. <laughs> I tell people I have to wear a swimming dress when I go to the beach because people think my legs, my thighs are covered by jellyfish and they try to come and help me. That's a very funny joke. Wake up. I'm talking about me. I'm, you're not saying it. It's me doing it. Eholé. For years, I, well, only for a couple of years, I worked with a group called Honey Child Milk. We actually did a coon show. Now, I know that's difficult. But we did a show about people in Coonville. This was really to make you do what? And one of the funniest parts and, and startling parts was a song that I sang with my daughter. And I'd say to her, I hope I'll live to see you again. See you again in Coonsville. And people were like this. Did she say Kunzu? Because <laughs> the music was fabulous. We wrote everything. But she was, yeah. Are we supposed to? It? I did another character who followed me in a lot of my one person shows because I realized that this kind of performance wasn't a big enough risk for me. Now, if you are a performer, especially performance art or theater, it's something about getting on the stage every night and saying the same things, and you try to plow that for new you. And after a while, the field is fallow. What is the biggest risk for me? Because there's no reason for me to be on stage like this unless there's something that excites me as well as you. So I started doing a lot of one-person shows. And the last one I did was walk a mile in my drawers, not moccasin. 
And then it was the culmination of this one character. How many of you remember Rodney Dangerous in the field, right? Well, I have a slave character called uh, Rodney Dangerous in the field, the first stand up comic. I don't get no repet. I don't get no repet. So remember, Rodney Dangerous had his tie. Well, he was shaking his shackle. I'm going down to the field to make some jokes because I've got me a captive audience, right? And he'd tell all these horrible jokes. And once he went to the owner, uh, this reminds you of this book. That's why I'm telling this story, Parsley. Went to the owner, and he asked the owner to give him his freedom. What will I have to do to get my freedom? And so the owner says, well, hell, you don't have to tell me a real funny joke. Take my white plea. Take my white plea. And he did. So Randy gets, oh, and he, he hits him once. Oh, he hits him twice. Oh, oh, he hits him three times. Oh, oh, oh. Take me to the bridge, y'all. And he did. And he hung him. OK, now, what did I just do? Take my wife, please, is Henny Youngman. Henny Youngman was a famous Jewish comic. Also, part of Jewish history is building the, being slaves and building the pyramids in Egypt. Hit me once, hit me twice, that's James Brown. Take me to the bridge is the bridge of any of these rock songs. Dun, 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 ow! And then he hung him from it. So he's hanging, and Woody Woodpecker comes in and chews through the rope. So there's another, uh, so this whole thing is very pop culture. This I love, I wrote music to it. This is the kind of thing that kept me doing performance because it allowed me to be as obtuse and absurd as I wanted to be, but talk about racism and gender. And another part of it, Rodney meets, um, what was Jefferson's paramour's name? Thank you. Remember Sally Hemings? went to Paris. And so he's saying, hey, Sally. And she says, bonjour, Rodney. And so there's a whole bit about them talking until it wheedles down to him, realizing that she's not interesting to him. And he talks to her about what her future will be. Well, I'm not doing that. Firstly, I can't remember lines anymore. So I don't do that kind of performance anymore. I still do some performance, though. I do a lot more singing. This is me working with one of my performance partners. Lorraine Whittlesey, we're called Ebony and Irony. Get it? <laughs> you just have to figure out who's who. And I also work with younger artists sometimes, a spoken word and hip hop artists. This is me doing some work. I do a lot of scatting, which directly relates to beat music, all of that in the work. And then I end with a picture of my mom in our living room at the end of her life. I am one child born. I am one child born left. I am one child born left to carry on. If you have any questions or comments, you can bring me presents and money directly to the stage. Yes, right there. I want to thank you for uh, Harriet Tugman information. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. I, I, I love that uh, attention to her because she was quite a lady. Quite a lady. You talk about. Uh, mean lack of education, but she had a way of getting her point across. So I yes. thank you for that. And also the uh, mistaken identity piece. Which your museum bought, they put out hard cash, actual cash. Oh, they did, <laughs> all right, all right. Okay, and I, I, that's, it's beautiful. I had a question, maybe I can ask you in private. No, you can ask me up in front of people. Okay. I'm not cussing because they're kids okay. here. Uh, the tail on the back of the, of yeah. the lady. 
what does that represent? Well, I think he's really a man, and it's a, he's oh. a devil. Okay. He's got little horns. Somebody. Mistaken for me, mistaken identity means a lot of things. Through through what's happening to us right now in our country, actually in the world, because nationalism is spreading everywhere. Yes. The guise that people have is many times the opposite, and through it, we must learn. So this is an opportunity for us to stand up. This is what this is. So his identity is mistaken because he might be bringing truth. Wow. And that is, you know, we, we should be able to learn out of all of this stuff. Not only just to not comb your hair like that, yeah. but <laughs> uh. or to do tans where you have the eye white thing. I don't understand how they let him out like that. I mean, if he was even doing a great job, I'd yeah. say like, but you can't do a tan like that. People <laughs> are going to think you're stupid and stuff. You can't, and get some hairspray to hold that thing down. Yes. I mean, who lets him be like that? I don't know. So it's also talking about him being surrounded by people who aren't really thinking about his welfare. How are we having that government now? It's deeper than just him being a buffoon. So thank this, you. this that work is about those many layers. Of, okay, thank you so welcome. much. Oh, thank you. <laughs> see how people see egos are, you see what I'm trying to say? Yes, someone else give me something. Don't be scared. I ain't going to do them horrible to you, mostly. <laughs> Is this really what's going to, I have to beg? There are no shills in the audience? Here, okay. Oh, right there. Let me, I'll bring a microphone over to you, or Kara will pass one down. There we go. Hi, so good to see and hear you. Thank you. Though. Um, did you know the artist Elizabeth Catlett? I did not know her. And people ask that because we were also in Mexico, but you have to have a, a real bunch of stones to go to somebody. Hello, Miss Catlett, can I come and visit you? I, I was asking because she went to graduate school in Iowa. At yes, the University and of Iowa. she was, of course, an icon. And they were living in Mexico when I was in Mexico, but I never had the stones to go and meet her. Beyond that, her work? Well, of course, it's... Firstly, she's a, a, a sculptress. And for many artists during that time, for women, you maybe would be a painter and you might be in crafts, but being a sculptress the way she was a sculptress was a big deal. And the fact that she made a decision to not live in the United States because of its deficits for her and go to another country, marry a Mexican man, have Mexican children, and make artwork that was not only implicitly African-American, but also had references that were Mexican. You have to remember, Mexico has a big black heritage because wherever the Spanish went, so goeth their slaveth. So she worked on those roots as well. So uh, she's one of the, um, the ancestors, the, the aunties that, that young artists use. And it should be all artists, but for sure African-American artists and women specifically see her as, as one of the real aunties for us. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so collaboration seems to be, have been a really big part of your work. I'm wondering if there are any collaborations on the horizon that you're working towards or working on right now? Well, I don't know what I, you know, I was asked again from my gallery, what do you want to do? And, and, and being um, a mentor is a big part of what I do. I don't wish to teach beadwork so much anymore. I've taught so many people how to do beadwork. Let them teach the, be the basics of beadwork. But I like collaborating. Those guns that we did, me working with people, you lay this down, go drop this, no, let's do this, tell me why you're putting it there. I like that, but I can tell you the truth. I think I want to stay home and make work in the studio. Now, the collaboration may be, since I don't blow glass, I work with casting, I can do that, but blowing glass, I'll probably go to more studios. I was just in San Francisco, and, and I was asked to come to the last working glass studio in San Francisco proper, outside of a school. It's in a black neighborhood. So I went, the students from, were from CalArts, and they were all white, but the person who led it was black. And I talked to them and showed them how to add beadwork into work. And what's wild about it is that 
the African American Senior Citizens Building came over and watched. To see what I mean about just what, that happened because I was there. That's what I would like to do. That's the kind of collaboration. And people who are working with materials that um, I don't do, don't ever want to learn how to do, and that are dangerous, so they should do it. <laughs> you know, when you watch people blow glass, it's that's so fascinating, you do it. <laughs> uh, that's probably it. But there's, I have great joy of just sitting around making my own work in my work. There's Not with me, no. Oh, no. She's, she's. Uh, yeah, a lot of the artistic collaborations you do, it seems like uh, the impression I got was that you added yours to what they did first. Uh, am I getting the right impression? Uh, Say that again, what do you mean? That, you know, you went to the artist in Italy and they were doing the glass work and you added your beads to their work. Uh, you, uh, the gun that you showed, you added your touch to their work. Um, am I seeing your type of collaboration first? You go there and study what they do and then figure out how you can add to, add to what they do? It depends. It depends. Most, I've been doing glass for a long, long time. And so it's interesting you should ask that question because the studio, the Beringo studio, sometimes works, I think for a long time, it was that they worked with people who were artists and, or in some way in the arts world but didn't necessarily do glass or didn't know about glass. So they came and that was a great fun for them. You know, um, I'm pronouncing his name incorrectly because I can't remember, but Pharaoh, um, and I'm so happy that, the, how do I pronounce it? Pharrell. He did a piece there, right? So, but he's not a visual artist. But I've been doing art glass for a long time. So when I went in and asked him to do something, and they said, no, I said, oh, oh, say. I was doing theater for a long time, so theater. But what I do is collect pieces that create, many times they're of the very period that I'm talking about, like that shot bottle. And I know that it elicits something from you that if I made it wouldn't be the same. You, somebody had one of those things in their houses. Uh, there's a series that I took out, and I think I took it out because I was talking to a lot of kids, called um, God, what's the name of it? But it's about, it's about us going one day and just being able to laugh at the things that are still plaguing us. And it starts with a small mammy and she's holding a white penis instead of a rolling pin. It was originally a rolling pin, but it didn't even look like a rolling pin. And there were there a, a series of figures like that. Right, well, these mammies or these figures, if I made them, then they would be my idea of what they are. But the fact that some of these things came from Japan and they're the Japanese idea about a stereotype about a black person, see how uh, right away you're going to, hmm. That's when I'm like, well, I have to use that instead, instead of making it. Is that answering your question? Good. And I think that's really important because it talks about how over centuries we keep repeating the same thing. I have collected, because they're, firstly they're beautiful, but you collect things from pre-war Japan and it has pre-war Japan under it. And for years they just, I, I don't know if they're still doing this toothpaste because they got yelled at, but it's called darky toothpaste. And it's a black guy with a top hat on it and you're like, but did somebody tell you that's going to cause trouble someday. Well, these are still people who um, don't have a large enough population of African Americans or Africans in their country, possibly for it to make a difference. Well, and there's freedom of will. And that made sense when we didn't have computers and this kind of global 
connection. Now I think it's important for all of us to think about what we're doing that would in some how hurt or belittle somebody else, even if they're not our next door neighbor. And I, that's what my artwork does too. Because the more global we become, the more it's an opportunity for this young couple in the back to be in Chesnia, going to school or on their beach, because it's a great beach, and to have people say things to you that are cruel and unkind because of their ignorance. So if I can help purvey some kind of knowledge in that regard, that is what I do. Thank you. Thanks. Is that it, you think? Anybody else before I get thrown out? We got one over here. She's an artist. Oh, funny you should say that. <laughs> because I wanted to, if you could talk about the concept of the value people put on art. You said you went uh, an undergrad and you tried painting and someone said, try something yeah. else. <laughs> um, you know, I've worked with young people and they'll say, oh, I'm not a very good artist or I can't draw or that doesn't look good. And I always tell them, it's your, it's your eyes and you're sharing what you see with the world. So you, there's no judgment of good and bad. Can well, you talk about... I do judge. People judge all the time. We like to say we don't judge, but we do. Yeah. And I just say, then what do you think will make it better? Uh -huh. Because, they, you know, you can look at you trying to be nice, but you're like, that's a crappy piece of work. Oh my God. I don't know if he's be in the class. So you talk about, well, you know, what about it don't you like? And well, how come, you know what? So you don't know how to make the colors the way you want? Let's work on color then and figure out what color means to you and how to do it that way. Because through whatever we're doing, I'm still Joyce, and of course I'll make judgments. That, that ju remember that was 1969, so that was many, many, that was last century, darling. So people's thinking about that and what artwork should look like. Unfortunately, it's very similar to what happens now. I'm glad you said that, because this is, talks about something. Uh, for years, I would come in as, a, as someone who was doing this. Maybe I teach, and I do crits with students. And the African-American, sometimes the Latino uh, students would come by and say, like, you know, I, I can't get a crit like this from my teachers because my teachers are basically white, they're European, and they, they don't know anything about my background. Okay but they don't see the value of my background. So they tell me not to do this. Do you know how hard that is for somebody who's paying tens of thousands of dollars to hear that their way of creating is not valid because you don't know about it? Okay, so there's been a lot of pushing and that's changed a bit, I hope. I was asked to do the keynote at the College Art Association, and I did, and I spoke to the strength that artists have and how wonderful we've been, but we have to remember that diversity means diversity not only in the student body and in the teachers, but in the administration. Because when was the last time you used Corinthian College, Corinthian column in a conversation? When was the last time you talked about that? Why do I have to only look at the Romans and the Greeks. That's old and how many times do you talk? Okay, so why can't Africa, native, uh, the indigenous people of the world be involved in that conversation? So I'm always pushing that, right? And diversity within an administration is very important because those are the people with the money so you can watch things change brass tacks. I was just in California receiving my second honorary doctorate. <laughs> yes, I said it. And I want you to know from CalArts, and I was like, what? And really, really sad that my parents weren't here, but I said my parents were in, in well, my father, I told you, he was in purgatory, because every time he gets to the front door, he starts flirting with somebody, and you're like, back of the line. But my mother is like walking right in past God's secretary. You don't have an appointment. God, my baby's down there. You know I've been working hard. 
I think she needs, and my mother wouldn't even know about doctorates. She needs to not adopt it, on that, and you know what I mean? And she's a bonicizing God. And uh, look here, God. And God's like, well, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> so a young woman who was graduating, an African-American was graduating, and uh, my art godson, who is from Baltimore, but lives in San Francisco, gave me a little uh, party. And she said, can I bring my glass and show you? I'm like, absolutely, because that's what I'm supposed to do. The Smithsonian gave me, it was this April that passed, the Visionary Award. And when I went there, I said, OK, when am I going to talk to kids? They said, you want to talk to students? I said, of course. You just call me a visionary. Isn't that what I'm supposed to do? They said, well, most people won't do that. OK, so of course, I will look at her work. She brought some very interesting glass, and I talked to her. It was, a lot of it was about black history, you know, cotton or something else. But nicely done. Um, and she had the obligatory shackles, had some shackles. You know what that means? So like for a, for a cubist, you, have to, to, you got this, and for black people, and the shackles. And um, she looked at me and said, I've never had a critique like this before. Now, Cal Arts is not a cheap school. And I said, why? She said, because they, they, they don't believe that I should be doing this kind of work, and they don't see the importance of my ethnic background. And you're like, but this is 2019, and we had Obama. Didn't, didn't any, well, okay, why am I saying this? Because the same teachers who taught them are the ones who were taught by them, and they're all going from the same playbook. And diversity in the administrative parts and in the faculty will make how we teach more diverse. And that's what's important. So that's why I'm still on the road, because I'm 70 and I could be at home getting fatter. The time somebody was laughing like, oh God, please no. <laughs> you know, I could be at home, but uh, I've been given a great gift and I've also begun, it becomes my responsibility until I can anymore to be one in a number who's out there talking to stuff. So that's why that's important, babe. Thanks. Joyce, thank you for visiting us from Baltimore. Thank you, audience. I'm so glad you got to hear this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I got a, a standing revation. How wonderful. The front row, I'm not talking. Thank you. <laughs>